Hello and welcome back to Manifolds, the video series where we talk about higher dimensional integration on generalized surfaces. And in today's part 50, we will look at the properties of our exterior derivative and also consider some examples. However, as always, before we start with the discussion, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And the good thing is, as a supporter, you have access to a lot of additional material for the videos, which you can find with the link in the description. And then without further ado, let's immediately start with the Cartan derivative, also known as the exterior derivative. And there we already know, it's a linear operator defined for any k form on our manifold. This means the map dk has the domain given as omega k and maps into omega k plus 1. And please recall that this exterior derivative exists for any integer k for an n-dimensional manifold m. However, in order to discuss this nice map, it's better to restrict ourselves to just one chart of the manifold. This means we just consider our differential form on u and translate everything to Rn. This is really helpful because in the local representation, our differential form can be written as a linear combination of these terms here. And because of the linearity of the Cartan derivative, it's sufficient for us to consider just one of these terms of the linear combination. Hence, here we just have a smooth component function we call f and it's defined on the whole chart u. So now it's quite easy to see what we have here is a well-defined differential form of order k defined on u. So if we see m as given by u, we can just apply our dk operation. And there we can use the definition from the last video, which just tells us that this exterior derivative is pushed to the smooth function f which just means we get the ordinary differential df. And it's connected with the wedge product to the other one forms. So we immediately recognize that this definition brings us to a k plus 1 form. So please remember this important formula. This is what happens with the Cartan derivative on a chart. And if you want, you can also rewrite the differential of f with the directional derivatives as we have done it in the last video. This means we get a sum over all n standard directional derivatives. So del j, where j goes from 1 to n. And then we also have del j f times the differential dxj. And also this one form is combined with the wedge product to all the other one forms. So in summary, I would say you can see this whole box here as the definition of the Cartan derivative on a chart. And now we can use this definition to actually show the properties we want to have. For example, one of the properties was that we also have a product rule like for the ordinary differentiation. This means if we apply this D operation to a K form and an L form, which are connected by a wedge product, then we can split it up into a sum of two terms. And again, by linearity, we are allowed to keep it simple, so we can just consider this one as our k form omega. And on the other hand, our eta can be given by an L form, which has g as a component function. So it looks almost the same, but here we have L1 forms in the wedge product. However, this already tells us that in the first step, we can put f and g together at the front. So we have the product f times g, and then all the one forms together. So this is our k plus l form and now we can apply our d to it. Which simply means that we just have the differential of f times g. And obviously there we already know the product rule. It's the standard product rule like we have it for Jacobians. And in fact this is why we have it in this abstract notation as well. And it's just the f times g plus f times dg. So quite simple and you already see we can distribute this wedge to both terms in the sum. So there we have the first part plus the second part. And now we want to make everything nicer. For example, we could push this g to the original position there. 
This is definitely an allowed operation in the wedge product, so we can just do it. Hence, here we find our original K form eta. And now obviously, we would also like to make the second part prettier, but there we have to push dg. And this is also allowed in the wedge product, because it's anti-commutative. Which actually means, that flipping the order of the product is allowed, but a sign can come in. And indeed, if we flip to one forms, we get in minus one, and now we can see, we have to do exactly k flips to reach this point. Therefore, pushing dg to the wanted position brings in minus 1 to the power k. And with that we are done, because we can rewrite the first part as dk of omega wedge eta. And then we have plus or minus, depending what k is. And then the original omega wedge d eta. And there we have it, this is the product rule of the exterior derivative for differential forms. And with that we are also able to prove the other property we have talked about last time. And this was the so-called complex property, which just states that applying d two times in a row gives us zero. Hence for k form omega, you would first apply dk and afterwards dk plus one. And also here we can use the same representation for omega as before. And as always, we can just use the definition from above and maybe let's use the one with the directional derivatives. So what we get is a finite sum, where we have the del j's of f involved. And now obviously in the next step, we can just do it again for the k plus one form. And this just gives us a second sum, so we have one over i and one over j. And moreover, we also get del i in, and also the differential dxi. So we immediately see that the result is a k plus 2 form as we want it, but we also have something here in the front which is interesting. Indeed, I would say we can separate this because the whole information we need is in there. So first, here you see we have a directional derivative of a directional derivative, which means if we translate that with the chart to Rn, we have a partial derivative of second order. Roughly speaking, you first have the partial derivative with respect to xj and then with respect to xi. However, since we have a smooth function, Schwarz's theorem holds, which means we can exchange the order of the partial derivatives. In other words, here in the first term we have a symmetry in the two indices i and j, the order does not matter. However, on the other hand, we also have this last term there, which is clearly anti-symmetric in the two indices. So if we exchange the order there, we get in a minus sign. So the conclusion is, if we sum over all possibilities here, we always have one with a plus sign and one with a minus sign and they will cancel. So indeed, we just get out zero. And there we have it, this is the complex property, which we now have proven on one chart. So maybe this is good enough for the properties of the exterior derivative. Now let's finally look at an example. And in order to keep it simple, let's take a one form on R3. So there the manifold is the whole three-dimensional space, where we already know that we just need one chart to describe it. In fact, we can just take the identity map as our chart. Therefore, I can simply say omega is given as v1 times dx1 plus v2 times dx2 plus finally the same with index 3. Which actually also means that omega has the same information as a smooth map v from R3 into R3. And this one you might know as a standard three-dimensional vector field. And now let's use the exterior derivative and let's see what d omega gives us. By definition, we already know that we can just use the partial derivatives. So the first one would be del v1 with respect to x1. And maybe here I use the superscript notation for the partial derivative, like the Ricci calculus suggests. Indeed, for the one forms, we also already use the notation from the Ricci calculus. Okay, and now the general formula tells us that we have a whole sum of the partial derivatives 
a new one form combined with the old one form. Therefore the next term would be the same but now with respect to the variable x2. And finally the third term would be with respect to x3. And please note, this was just the Cartor derivative of the first part in our omega. Therefore we have to do the same thing for the other parts as well. So let's start with the second part where we have v2 and x2. And there we also have three partial derivatives such that we have this. And then finally we can do the same thing again for v3 dx3. So there we have our whole result which we could simplify now. Indeed we immediately see that such a combination dx1 dx1 in the wedge product gives us zero. Since the wedge product is anti-commutative we have three parts here which just vanish. Moreover it also tells us that we can recombine the parts. For example this one can be combined with that one. And by doing that you see we only have three parts left. However please never forget we always introduce a minus sign when we exchange the two one forms. Therefore if we start with that one we first have del v3 with respect to x2 and the other one with a minus sign. So this is the first component function for this two form and then I would say let's go to the next one. There I want to have dx1 wedge dx3 so we first have this term minus that term. So all not so complicated you just have to be careful where the minus sign is. And then finally the last term is dx1 wedge dx2. And there you should also note that we always have the same indices involved in the partial derivatives as well. And there we finally have it. This is the Cartor derivative of our omega. And you might recognize these partial derivatives as the curl of our vector field v. This curl operation is something special that exists in R3 as a circulation description of a vector field. So curl of v makes sense in R3 and can be described as Nabla vector product with v. And if you do that you should see we get exactly the same components out as we have it here for our two form. And now in the case you know some more classical vector analysis you also might remember the formula divergence of the curl of a vector field is equal to zero. And if you see that it should remind you of our complex property of our exterior derivative. And in fact this is just a special case of d after d is equal to zero in three dimensions. So in other words now we have something more general that also works in higher dimensions. But still please remember we don't lose the special case in three dimensions because the calculation shows us that we just need to interpret the result in the correct way. This means to get the traditional curl out we have to order these two forms in the correct way. But maybe this is good enough for today because we will definitely discuss the connections to the classical vector analysis in more details later. So I really hope I meet you in the next video and have a nice day. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.